Good afternoon. Um, my name is Minyan Liu. I'm the chair of Electrical and Computer Engineering. It gives me great pleasure to introduce this year's recipients of the Distinguished University Innovator Award, Professor David Blau and Professor Dennis Sylvester. I'm particularly proud because they are both professors of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Together, the two of them have been working as a team for about 18 years. They have won numerous multi-million dollar research awards and built a very large and vibrant research uh, group. And through that process, they've also founded a number of startups. The two most prominent are MB Micro, that commercializes their innovation in low power computing, and Cubeworks, that commercializes their innovation in miniaturized computers. Uh, their, uh, their cube, their cube millimeter, cube millimeter computer is now recognized as the world's tiniest computer and on display at a computer museum in Mountain View, California. And it has the promise to become the ideal candidate for the future of Internet of Things. And now let me invite the two of them up here and tell you the rest of their story. Thank you. for the introduction, wherever, wherever you went, there you are. Um, so uh, it's a great honor to uh, receive this award, especially next to my good friend and, and colleague, David. Um, so we have a, a set of slides just to go through um, some of the background on, on things that we've done uh, together to, um, uh, to merit the uh, award. So we're gonna go through those. We're gonna provide some background uh, and talk about some trends uh, in, the, in, the, in the field. And then we're gonna move to a panel where we'll talk about uh, commercialization efforts in um, post CMOS uh, machine learning era. So uh, I'll, I guess I'll start. Um, so the three companies, so Mingyan just mentioned two of these three companies, but these are the three companies that together we've had a hand in in different ways. Um, first of all, Ambic Micro is, is, is the, probably the, the long, uh, largest and it has been around the longest. This is um, what I would say is the most conventional uh, path where one of uh, our PhD students, Scott Hansen, uh, decided that he really believed in the technology that we had developed with him and other students in the late uh, 2000s, uh, that decade, and uh, basically uh, said, you know, I want to make this uh, into a company, and together with, with David and my, myself. So uh, we did that. Um, we really learned a lot, at least I did, I think, in that process of how you move from writing research papers where the improvements that you're showing uh, on, in that paper over state of the art uh, are very large, and then by the time you uh, get to a point where you can manufacture that instead of building one test chip, you've lost some of that advantage, right? And the question is, how little of that can you give back? Because when you take it to market, you still want to have a significant advantage if you want to displace or dislodge existing um, existing companies. So this was a much this this is a company that moved into uh, ultra low power microcontrollers, which are the sort of the brains of many of the Internet of Things and other devices, wearables and things like that. So we had to displace uh, existing uh, uh, companies to do that. Cubeworks uh, was a bit different. Uh, Cubeworks is, uh, we started very small, we didn't go for uh, big VC money right away like Ambic wound up being funded by Kleiner Perkins and other uh, very large VCs, but Cubeworks started a little bit smaller and leaner and, and really sort of grew organically in Ann Arbor. Um, and uh, it really focused a lot on building systems as opposed to individual components or chips. And also we had to define new application areas for Cubeworks because there weren't existing applications for the cubic millimeter uh, designs that, that Mingyan alluded to. So these were completely new devices and, and, and that's been a really exciting time and David can talk more about that later because he's very um, uh, involved in that now. And Mythic, uh, David and I are not founders of Mythic. Mythic is, an, is, a, is a startup company that licensed our technology and it was founded by our former PhD student Dave Fick and a postdoc of ours uh, Mike Henry, and so we've been involved in different ways in this, and what's interesting about Mythic is that they've really um, grown very rapidly uh, because of the machine learning wave that we'll be talking about in the panel, uh, and so it's been very interesting to see that go from, you know, three or four employees to 75 employees in a very short amount of time, and, and all the good and bad that comes with that, right? So, um, so going on, I think, to the next slide. 
So uh, we wanted to just give you a quick picture of like how the progression happened. And uh, so I'm going to go very fast, uh, but this is really the start. Uh, and I'm going to analyze all of these graphs for you now. Um, so uh, this is kind of the theory, uh, and this is really actually the start of our overall work, uh, where we had a student, uh, Bo Zai, who is now long graduated, actually uh, went to a, a, a large semiconductor company and then went into business himself. Um, uh, found this sort of energy optimal point for operating circuits, and I'll leave it at that. Um, and we published this, and this was really an analysis paper. And this gave us the idea that, wow, we can actually bring down the power a lot further than we had thought. And then we started thinking about how to actually implement that in circuits. Uh, and so, uh, and we sort of tried to show you a very quick progression here, uh, where we started out with a very little processor at the very top there, and just try to see, well, can we take this new kind of uh, sub-threshold design, as it's called, uh, and actually implement something and get it to actually work. Uh, we published that, and then we were encouraged, and then we built a slightly larger version of that. And then we started growing it, and I think this was very critical, because we had initially, we did only like maybe a couple blocks, uh, but then over time, uh, we started making entire processors that were really functional, including commercial architectures. Uh, so that was another pivotal point, I think, in our sort of path to commercialization, that we didn't just stay with sort of toy examples, but we took it also into industrial application processors. Um, and then we started building systems, and eventually we got to the interocular uh, pressure monitor, which was a complete little system that you could implant, at least in theory, uh, in your eye. Uh, it worked, mostly. And um, it was really tiny, and it was really a, a first of its kind. It was really, uh, I think, quite ahead of any other systems of that size. Um, and then something uh, very interesting happened. Um, and so this is a quote from the uh, movie, The Field of Dreams. I don't know if any of you remember it. Uh, but it really stuck with us because we published uh, that paper with the interocular pressure sensor at a circuit conference uh, in 2011. And then what happened was that we got all these responses, and they weren't from circuit designers, which is what we were hoping for, you know, congratulating us on our really good circuit design. Um, in fact, circuit designers were a little, you know, hesitant about what we were doing, uh, but we got lots and lots of interest from people that wanted something like that. Uh, they wanted a little, tiny little sensor of some kind. Uh, and so this is just a, a listing of the ones that we got in the first few weeks. We were getting lots and lots of emails, uh, you know, we started sort of sorting through them. Uh, a lot of them, we were like, well, this is actually not even possible with the laws of physics that we have today because they wanted something really amazing. Uh, but some of them very, very interesting, but they were also all very, very different. Um, and so we really started to think of like, well, if this, we have this technology, we've built this really tiny, complete system now. How do we now, you know, make that feasible for all these different application spaces? Uh, and so we kind of moved to a modular approach, uh, which I won't go into a lot of detail, but by stacking different chips on top of each other and making that very modular and being able to uh, switch chips in and out, uh, you know, we could actually, we felt, address a lot of different markets, a lot of different applications um, to try to kind of open up this new sort of very small millimeter scale computing uh, field. Um, and so that became uh, what is now known the Michigan Micro Mode. This is sitting on a, what is it? Is it a nickel? I think it's a nickel. Uh, so you can see how small and tiny it is. This is on display, as Min Yang mentioned. Uh, it's a computer history museum. And we've made one actually even smaller than that. So, so that's kind of the technology route. Uh, Dennis will take you now through the commercialization uh, yeah. that sort of went alongside with that. Yes, yeah, so this just gives you a timeline of some of the companies that I introduced at the beginning. Um, it's not as exciting as the nickel picture, so I'll go through it very quickly. Uh, so you can see that when David and I started working together, it was around 2001, and we were working on different topics, not what we're doing now. Uh, and around 2004, with the paper that he took the clip of, um, then we turned our attention to this, uh, to this area. Um, and, uh, you know, Ambic was founded in 2010. Uh, it moved to Austin a year later. Um, and uh, has grown um, to about 80 employees, if you look down at the bottom, and they've shipped 50 million chips uh, to date. And uh, so that's been very um, uh, successful. Uh, our relationship with ARM, so David mentioned the commercial microcontrollers and processors that we were building even in the research domain, was based on a, uh, a research relationship that, that we had at the university. So that was able to basically parlay into uh, a, a you know, strategic investment from 
arm in AMBIG, uh, a seat on the board, and a really nice um, uh, agreement with them to basically uh, push that forward. So that was something that we really benefited from the university and our research relationships. Um, a couple of years later, CubeWorks and um, Mythic, uh, which was called Isocline initially, uh, were founded. Mythic also moved to Austin. Uh, we'll touch on maybe some of this uh, in the panel. Uh, you'll notice a trend of some companies moving out of Ann Arbor in this area and of some other companies staying in Ann Arbor. So there's you know, big decisions to be made there that we had to, to, we had to deal with as well. Um, and um, just to fast forward to today, so Mythic is, um, has not shipped its first product. It's, um, uh, it changed its focus in 2015. It's an interesting, interesting story uh, relevant to the panel as well. So Mythic started by looking at uh, an analog computation approach to um, basically doing GPS correlation, so doing correlators, calculating correlation coefficients uh, to compute where the satellites are and therefore to compute your position. So they had a really good, interesting approach. We published it at this leading, uh, world's leading circuit design conference and it was really interesting. And so they went around and pitched it to venture capitalists and they said, oh, by the way, we also have some ideas on doing machine learning, in-memory compute, but our main thing is this GPS thing. And they said, forget the GPS thing, we just care about the machine learning thing. So they've completely changed gears uh, and, and raised, I think, about $85 million in a small number of years. So, Although they almost went bankrupt in the process. <laughs> I think Fick uh, yeah, mortgaged his garage or something like that. Too. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and then meanwhile, CubeWorks' latest status is, is that they have uh, shipping, they're shipping products into two markets and they've raised a smaller, more modest amount of money because, again, taking a different strategy and a different approach to, uh, to uh, building a company. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, um, Ambic really went into a market that was already existing and was trying to displace parts that were already out there with lower power versions, uh, to competing, out-competing them, essentially. And so that was a, a much faster path, whereas, as Dennis has also mentioned, CubeWorks is really trying to find kind of a new space uh, that is really not yet very much established. And so uh, we've taken a very different approach intentionally, uh, and it's taken a, a longer path, uh, but they're doing uh, quite well as well. So um, these are some of the people that need to be acknowledged as part of this award. The award is, is at least as uh, uh, much due to the students um, that uh, are leading these companies as to Dave and I. Um, and so these are some old pictures. I think 2009, 2011, uh, the three pictures over here. Dave Hartman, you all know, and he's in the audience somewhere, there he is, uh, was uh, a, a significant mentor uh, for Scott Hansen, the founder of Ambic in the early days, uh, and is uh, very much appreciated. So Scott's sitting there looking up at me, it looks like, uh, uh, 10 years ago. And uh, up top, they, uh, Dave Fick is right there, the founder of Mythic, and uh, a very uh, strong uh, CTO there. And on the top right, Dave is talking to Zeon Fu, who's the CEO of CubeWorks, and Yuho Kim, who is the CTO of, of, of CubeWorks. So you can see uh, different companies represented here. Now Scott, you can see here, looks you know, really young. He was just a young guy going out raising money for this company. But after nine years in the startup game, he, he, he looks like this now. So he <laughs> said that to me yesterday. Uh, asked him for a selfie. So, um, so you all know this well, right? He's much wiser now. <laughs> <laughs> so, a one-time thing. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of you have also, you've heard a lot about uh, machine learning. The other big trend uh, today is, uh, is also IoT, Internet of Things. And so we wanted to sort of highlight how, uh, what we're doing and in general what is happening with uh, IoT. And so, um, you know, it's interesting because IoT actually is working off of a trend that many people don't know about, which is called Bell's Law. Uh, most of you might have heard um, of Moore's Law, uh, but this is actually was coined around the same time, and it's showing that uh, what's happening is that computing systems, as we go through the time, are, are shrinking actually in size. It's something we all unconsciously know, but we don't always necessarily uh, kind of uh, verbalize uh, and express. So uh, early computing systems were, you know, bulky, huge, and expensive, and now, you know, your computing system is really your cell phone, right, which has more compute power than these old systems. Um, and so actually, this is uh, around the time that we started do this, doing this work, we also saw this law, which was much more obscure at the time, it's become more known now. Um, and so one of our goals was also to try to uh, get on this roadmap and push it further along. And where we really are now is this Internet of Things, uh, moderate size sensors uh, that are connected to the Internet, that sense the environment around us. Uh, they're not interacting with us directly, 
uh, through keyboards and displays, but they're uh, taking sensing readings of what's going on in the environment or actuating on it, um, and then communicating that through the web. And so we can expect, uh, and as we've tried to participate in, is to bring that further down, to make them smaller uh, to the millimeter scale. And so if this trend holds, the trend holds, then we will be uh, part of that picture, um, and we'll see that continuing even further. So, so. on the slide still, so the, the, the trend of miniaturization, the trend of um, uh, Internet of Things, these were things we knew about in the earlier days of our, our work in this area. The third, the third trend that's mentioned here was something that's really only about, you know, mostly about five years old. You can trace it back to about 12, actually, 2012, but really a couple years later. Um, and, and that's machine learning. And so this is a, a slide that might help set up the panel. Uh, I, I was in a workshop in, in late March uh, this year, and um, and this this person, uh, not, not, not Rudy Berger himself, but uh, someone else put this slide up, and it's total funding on the y-axis uh, for semiconductors uh, in blue, total semiconductor company funding by VCs, uh, and then the orange bar gives you an idea of how much of that is in uh, semiconductor companies that are devoted toward artificial intelligence or more specifically machine learning. And so what you can see, you see the blue bar has some trends and undulation, and you know, that's that's pretty well known. Software is getting a lot more money, uh, at least in the last 10 years. But you can see that uptick after 15. And not only that, but if you look at orange, you can see that that percentage is growing rapidly. And if you look at the 19 bar, and this is what he stressed in his talk, which was amazing, was that that is not a projection. That was year to date on March 20th. So two and a half months into the year, there was almost, there was as much funding as all of 2017, basically. Almost all of it, 83% of it, was going to, to, to companies that were in that so-called ML or AI space. So that was pretty eye-opening for us. So it's a major, major trend. That's why companies like Mythic and others have been able to raise so much money so quickly, and now it's, it's becoming time to produce. So with that, I think we'll wrap up. Uh, say thank you again for, um, for this uh, great award, and we really appreciate uh, being here. Thanks. So we'll move straight into the panel then, I guess. Dave? Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Sounds good. This mic? Okay. <clears throat> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, guys, for a great talk. Um, I was really disappointed. I thought you were going to go into details. <laughs> Every professor has to have at least one equation in their presentation, even if it's for a tech transfer award. Um, so good job, guys. Uh, all right, well, my name is Dave Wensloff. Um, I will give these guys um, uh, an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to set the stage uh, for this panel. So first of all, the title of this panel is Commercialization of Hardware Technologies in the post-CMOS machine learning era. So we realize this audience is probably not uh, technical, and so we want to start, um, so maybe give a bit of an overview of what all those mean uh, first. We'll have the panelists chime in on that. Um, and then we'll get into uh, more on the tech transfer side of things, and hopefully leave plenty of time for the audience to ask questions. So please start thinking about uh, what questions you want to ask the panelists. Um, so I'll start by just defining um, or Wikipedia's definition of machine learning. So let me read this to you for a sec. So what the heck is machine learning? Uh, machine learning is the scientific study of algorithms and statistical models that computer systems use to perform a specific task without using explicit instructions, like how our, our current uh, computers work is with programs, and, and instead relying on patterns and inference instead. Um, so it's a very specific, um, I call it an application-specific computer looking at uh, statistical models relying on inference or patterns to make decisions. And I think the last part is pretty critical, to make decisions. So some examples of where ML is being used is obviously in things like your Amazon Echo you know, for Alexa or the wake words. I'm, I'm not going to say it, but if you say her name on my iPhone, um, she'll immediately <laughs> wake up, those are examples um, of machine learning at the edge. Um, and I think this, this panel um, is a collection of experts in this field who have done research and really pushed the boundaries on what you can do in terms of machine learning uh, at the edge. 
So how do you increase performance? How do you increase efficiency of machine learning at the edge to enable some pretty, I think, some pretty fascinating new applications? Um, I mentioned, you know, Echo Dots, things like that, but also think, also think about applications like, uh, you know, like caller ID for your doorbell. Um, that's a thing now. You can buy that, bring doorbells to it. Um, so someone will walk up to your door, and if, if your doorbell has seen them before and you've tagged them, you'll get an alert on your phone that says who's at your door before they even ring your doorbell. Um, so enabling things like that is the technology that we're talking about today. Um, okay, so uh, just, um, again, I mentioned, I'll let these guys introduce themselves, but uh, real quick, just why we assembled this team. So this team um, has a lot of expertise, um, not only in uh, technology, but in tech transfer. Um, so maybe just to highlight some of that now, just how this technology has been transferred. I just jotted a few things down. First of all, I counted up startups uh, between all, all of us up here on the stage, and I counted nine. And maybe I missed one, but let me rattle them off. Ambic, Mythic, Cubeworks, Everactive, Movellus, Skygig, Crossbar, MemoryX, and SQL. Uh, between the panels on the stage. So I don't... So did I miss any? I know there might be, there might be some they can't talk about yet. So I'm, I'm, I'll ask two more times, and then, and then we'll see if they'll tell us. Um, but beyond just um, startups, um, another way that we transfer technology into the industry is through our students, right? They're our products. They're ultimately our products of this university. They go off and do some great things as well in large companies. Companies like Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, Samsung, ARM, the companies that are really building the backbone of all our compute devices, but then also companies like Google, Apple, um, Amazon, uh, who are consuming or generating tons and tons of data and need, need machine learning, for example, um, uh, uh, solutions to help them deal with that. Um, okay, so with that, that sets the stage. Um, you've already heard um, Dennis and David introduce themselves, so I'm gonna skip them. Um, and Wei uh, okay. and Ritu, if you don't mind, just say a couple words uh, okay. to introduce yourselves. Thanks. It's on, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks, Dave. Uh, so I'm Wei Lu, I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering as well. Um, so I work on devices and computing architectures uh, based on these new devices. Uh, so as Dave said, I have two startups, so I bring the average down, so I only have two. <laughs> <laughs> so one is Crossbar, it's, uh, it was founded uh, here, but we moved to California. Uh, it was founded in 2010. Um, the other is uh, Memrix, uh, it was just founded this year. It's based in Ann Arbor, so we want to stay here. <laughs> Hi y'all, I'm Ritu Das, I'm a, I'm a professor at uh, Computer Science and Engineering and um, my relation, I work in um, building custom computing systems for AI, machine learning, precision health and my relationship to this panel is, well I co-founded a company with David and another Satish who's not here, it's on precision health, it's called SQL, so we are very excited about it, <laughs> working hard on it. Yep. All right, thank you both. <clears throat> okay, so um, with that, we'll start, um, I think, uh, grilling these, this uh, collection of experts. So, uh, but uh, maybe just for starters, um, uh, just a bit of in, uh, introduction or background. Um, just wanted to ask them some questions, kind of to bring everyone up to speed. Um, but, you know, I know we're all professors, but we have to keep it simple, right, um, with our answers. So let's try and keep them short. So maybe for starters, we talk about the post-CMOS era. That's in the title of this panel, the post-CMOS era. So maybe for starters, we thought we'd introduce what is CMOS. So I want to ask Dennis this question. So can you tell us what is CMOS, what are some of the limits? Uh, and just while we're at it, um, can you give us a brief introduction to Moore's Law? Sure. So um, CMOS is the technological platform that our computing systems use today. So these are basically transistors uh, we use to do computation, storage, etc. For, for the most part. Um, CMOS has been the prevailing um, electronic technology for many decades, since probably around the early 70s. Um, and has uh, Moore's Law is a trend that many of you are probably familiar with, which says that essentially uh, the, 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 the scale or the size of transistors um, or the density that we can build these things with uh, improves exponentially with time, so roughly a factor of 2x denser or smaller transistors every couple of years. 
Um, and so that's taken us from uh, originally technology, uh, transistor dimensions on the order of 10 micron in the early days of, of building these things, down to what's typically called today. So if you have uh, the latest iPhone 11 uh, or whatever it's called these days, uh, it says it's called seven nanometers. Uh, now that's not really the dimension of anything on that, trend, uh, on that chip, uh, but it is indicative of the scale of the, uh, or the, the density of the transistors that we have. So, so we've moved to this ridiculously small number like seven nanometers and we're starting to approach fundamental physical limits in terms of how thin we can make layers, how short we can make transistor uh, gates without having them be completely leaking all the time and things like that. So we ha we, there's clearly some bounds and the most, most people today say that you know seven nanometer and then five nanometer and then probably three nanometer and that may be it and maybe you might get two nanometer out of it but that's it and those things will happen in about five six years so those 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 will be around five nanometer is going to ship next year so basically we are at the very end of building transistors as we know it today i think way will talk more about what's next yeah actually um <laughs> thanks dennis um, <laughs> so, so that is a great lead-in. Um, so we talk about the post-CMOS era um, and CMOS, uh, Moore's Law um, ending. So Wei, if you could just tell us, um, you know, what do you see as some of the trends for new devices um, that are going to enable, uh, or new technologies that can enable uh, a continuation of this post-CMOS era? Yep. So yeah, as Danny said, uh, so CMOS scaling is going to reach to an end very soon, right? So some of the scaling is already slowing down, that's why uh, our chips are getting hotter and hotter, and even if you can make all these devices, they are very, very fast, you can't use them all the time. That's a term called dark silicon. So we can't, we can't, we, we spend all this effort building the, these billion dollar transistors, but we are only using one quarter of the transistor we build, okay, because they are getting so hot uh, as we make them smaller. So, um, so that's, uh, so we can't just keep making transistors smaller, and soon we'll reach a limit that physically we can't make them smaller. So what's next? So there are a couple of directions. One is to, instead of making them smaller, in the little direction, we can go the vertical direction. That's called 3D integration. So uh, we can gain the density by stacking devices on top of each other. But that's very, very challenging because a fabricated transistors require single crystalline silicon that require high temperature. But stacking them, you need to do it at a low temperature. So that's very, very challenging. So the other direction is to integrate memory with logic more closely. So one big challenge we have today is that we have separate memory and logic. So even though your transistors or CMOS are very, very fast, but your memory are far away, so when you want to read data and process the data, most of your energy cost and the bottleneck actually happens between moving data between memory and logic. So another important direction is actually integrating memory much closer with the logic so we can actually process data locally, and that can also solve a lot of the challenges we have. So we, in the future, we, I mean, I think most people believe that to gain in performance, you can't just make the transistor smaller. That has been happening in the last 40 years, but it will soon stop. You actually have to gain performance by using, either using 3D integration or by merging memory with logic. So you can still continue to improve the performance, but not rely on making transistors smaller. Great, thanks. So this idea of moving memory closer to compute also kind of leads to compute in memory, uh, which is another um, uh, topic around machine learning you may have heard about. Um, so next question is for Ritu. So, uh, so just because Moore's Law is slowing down, it's getting harder and harder to build these systems. There's, uh, as Wei had mentioned, parts of the chip that are not turned off because of heat. So we can't turn every part of the chip on. That doesn't slow down the demand. So everybody cool. wants faster devices, longer range communication. Mm -hmm. The demand just keeps going and going, growing and growing. So Ritu, what, can you tell us a bit about what you see as some of the drivers? What's, what's the pull yeah. uh, for these technologies? Absolutely. Um, so I feel like there's a disruption coming from above and disruption coming from below in the computing mm -hmm. stack. Um, what is coming from above is that today computing systems have to crunch enormous amount of data. So for instance, a Facebook user um, would require to process half a gigabyte of data every, you know, every day or so. And if you go to fields like precision health, which I'm very excited about, um, an example is if you want to just do a liquid biopsy, one blood test, you need to process one terabyte of data per test. Right? So, so we need like sort of uh, computing systems to keep up with that deluge of data and all that information processing. So that's the disruption which is coming from above. So we have to still build systems which are faster and better and more efficient. And from below, as Wei and uh, Dennis were saying, the technology is not keeping up. 
right? So we got to do something crazy, something wild here. <laughs> um, that's where all the invention is happening. And uh, one secret sauce, I believe, which we still have is kind of, um, so far, uh, all the computing systems were made um, very general so that they could work on anything, whether it's a banking software or it's a machine learning algorithm. The same class of hardware could work across all these different application domains, right? Um, so what's the shift and transition which is happening now is to tailor things out, to make custom systems, custom across the whole stack, uh, especially in the hardware. And by customizing, there's a 100x efficiency improvement or even 1000x which is on the table for us to grab. And a lot of invention is happening in that space. So. Great, thanks. And then finally, question for David. So how do you see all these trends impacting research programs, both your own uh, research program and just across the country? Yeah, so I think uh, one of the things that's happening is that we essentially have to do more with less. Uh, in the past, in some sense, it was easy because we got faster and faster transistors from Weilu. Uh, <laughs> and all we have to do is just put them together. And, uh, and now that is slowing down, and I often draw a diagram of a caterpillar on the board for my students, and it's kind of like the head of the caterpillar was way ahead of us, and it was very stretched out. And what's now happening is that that is slowed down, and so the whole caterpillar is sort of collapsing on itself. Uh, what it means is that uh, for us that are above that in the stack, we have to do more, uh, and so we have to squeeze out, like Rita was saying, more out of the transistors that we have. And we're doing that by changing the way that we're specializing the uh, structures for particular applications. Uh, it's by doing a lot more exotic things. Uh, if you think about your cell phone, actually the circuits in there are way more sophisticated now, and a lot of the performance gains that are coming are not just because the transistor is better, but it's also because they're using much more exotic structures for the circuits, much uh, more advanced circuit structures. Um, and I think the other thing that's happening is that there is a shift in research towards systems. So people are now saying it's no longer about making just a little general purpose processor, but they're making higher level systems. And that's actually impacting students tremendously because now a student no longer can just know about a transistor uh, or even how to make a flip-flop or you know an adder but they have to know about machine learning or they have to know about vision algorithms uh, because they're making complete systems that go from transistors all the way up to the application and so I heard one professor lament that you know he felt uh, that they are now required to have students that uh, you know are cross-trained across all these different fields uh, because things are becoming so very much specialized to get more out of the transistors that we have. Yeah, great point. Good for the students too, I think, but <laughs> yeah, a lot more demanding than Not when yet. we were all uh, yeah. in school. Uh, that's for sure. All right, so shifting gears a little bit, let's talk about tech transfer. So maybe coming back to Ritu, since you've had some experience in Microsoft and Intel, um, why don't you tell us how you think, uh, or what, what place you think companies uh, what role, I should say, you think companies fill uh, mm -hmm. in this ecosystem as investors, as innovators themselves, as acquirers? Um, maybe just talk about your experience there. Yeah, I think, um, so they, they play all these different roles, right? So for instance, um, as you're talking, Intel does have a venture capital group as well as it has very advanced um, research and uh, development groups. Um, where I think uh, they play a, uh, they can play two good roles. One is to build an open source hardware ecosystem. Like for instance, NVIDIA released its NVIDIA uh, sort of um, accelerator, the, the whole system stack, and that was very useful for the community. Like we have to build, uh, we, don't, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. One of the big problems in building these systems, which David was talking about, is that how do, if you have to start from scratch, for academics to start inventing, it's crazy. I mean, it's, it's an enormous amount of work. So if uh, the big companies sort of pitch in and help us out with open source frameworks, that can be very useful. And I see that uh, trend happening in um, our community a lot. Even academics are pitching in to build these jump start kits for hardware. Um, and in terms of um, uh, investment, I think um, they, they are also like sort of partnering up with these startups and I see that happening a lot. Like it's, it's, it, it could go to an acquisition but it's sort of partnering up and sort of steering them a little bit towards the right problems and that's very useful too. Um, Microsoft research is a whole story in itself because it's, it's completely dedicated to research. So there the lessons you learn is like how in long term your research can actually go to something which is useful. So uh, that's, uh, that's the story there. Yeah. Thanks. 
Um, so perhaps bringing it back regionally, uh, we heard a bit about startups here that have started in Ann Arbor and then moved on, moved to Austin or uh, moved to the West Coast, moved to different locations. Uh, question for Dennis, um, since some of the more recent um, startups are now staying put uh, in Ann Arbor, so what do you see um, or do you notice any changes there? Is there a reason why um, all of a sudden startups are now staying local? Uh, and how do we keep more startups local? Um, so I'll try to answer that, although you may be better to answer it than I am. So, uh, because two of my three are gone. So um, the reason Ambic moved and the reason Mythic moved uh, really was because they had a um, aggressive growth strategy, right? And so, you know, if you want to go up to 80 employees or 100 employees in the near term, relatively near term, it's very difficult to find that sort of, you know, manpower, so to speak, in Ann Arbor. At least it was, you know, in the days when they were uh, considering whether to move or not. And definitely, it doesn't always go over way, very well. Last night at the dinner I was at, I mentioned that there was an Ann Arbor news article or online article about when Ambic moved and people were very unhappy and lots of angry commenters with pitchforks uh, about the use of university and state resources and then moving it out of state. Um, but, uh, so recently, CubeWorks, you know, which is an organic, you know, sort of slower growth, really take your time. Uh, uh, Movellus, which is, is more intermediate, it's, it's actually a, your company, uh, which is a sizable company, but has a really you know, decent, uh, most of their presence here in Ann Arbor. There are definitely more and more examples of people staying here. So I think that, uh, and then you know, Crossbar, uh, Waze company is another one of those very rapid growth companies, bringing a lot of money rapidly, and then you want to hire. So there's different strategies and different types of companies, and I think that the preference is to stay here, especially if the students and, and the faculty stay very involved. So if the faculty wants to stay involved, like you have with Movellus, like David has with QWorks in particular, it makes sense to have that you know gravity holding it here. And um, and I think there's a trend toward even with the larger companies like Everactive, your, your other company, where they'll have a satellite office here of a decent size, and then you get the the, 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 the mind share from that. So so I think there's different avenues to take, and I think that uh, the, you know the more companies that start here, the more companies that stay here, is going to have a positive feedback effect. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, okay, so time, quick time check. We got about ten minutes, so I want to turn it over uh, now. Now's the time. Now it's your job. You have to ask some questions. So you've had some time to think about it. You've heard some comments from the panelists. So who wants to be brave and go first? Otherwise, I will just cold call. <laughs> Another common strategy used by professors is you just wait. There's always a question. Someone's got a question. You just wait. <laughs> Maybe Maybe <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> In the post CMOS world, where do you place quantum computing? <laughs> and what are the tech transfer and startup opportunities there? I think way is most. Okay, I'll be brave. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, that's a great question. So um, there are some companies that really believe in quantum uh, computing. Uh, there are some that don't believe in quantum computing. So that's a hotly debated topic. So for example, one company, I can name names because they, they came out, they actually mentioned this publicly, they don't believe in quantum computing. That's HP. So HP, uh, it doesn't believe in quantum computing for general com computer. Uh, it can be used for uh, communication or encryption or decoding these kind of things. But for general computing, they don't believe that's really, um, because quantum computing, there's a lot of infrastructure you need to set up. You need low temperature, you need have the qubits working properly, uh, then you need to transfer the quantum information back to classical information. So, uh, so they, they feel there are a lot of opportunities um, that are there for quantum computing, right? I mean, um, it, it's very fast, uh, it's, it's highly, uh, yeah, parallel, so it's very extremely efficient and uh, for certain tasks. But uh, the question is, do you need quantum computer for everybody or every company, right? So HP, they are trying to become like a um, service company for enterprise. Uh, so, um, so they don't believe that most of the enterprises, they, may need, they need a quantum computer. So uh, for, for, for government, for some special applications, um, it may be very good. Again, this is, a, uh, this is a, I'm trying, I'm saying what they uh, wanted to say in one of their white papers. Uh, so that's, uh, 
that's one example. But obviously, there are other people who strongly believe in quantum computing. Um, uh, there are some arguments like uh, of computing we use today is some sort of quantum computing. There's just a, there's I mean you can stretch it that way. Uh, but uh, but it's very interesting topic. So yeah. So I, I don't know if you have the right answer or wrong answer, but that's yeah that's what very matters. diplomatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the only thing maybe to add is that uh, it takes tremendous infrastructure to do quantum computing. So it's really not a startup uh, kind of play. Uh, and there are some very, very large companies, IBM, Intel, that are investing, and Google investing tremendously in it. But if you look at it, they're only betting a very, very small percentage of their company on it. So, um, so no one is really making a huge bet on it. Slightly less diplomatic answer. <laughs> okay, next question. Dave. Thinking about autonomous vehicles and AI, machine learning, are there some things some of you are doing that make those intersect or you see how, how what you're doing is going to intersect to make that autonomous vehicle possible? So the question was around autonomous vehicles and what are the things that either the panel is doing or that the panel, panelists have observed that um, intersects machine learning and autonomous vehicles to help enable it. Sure, I can, I can take that. Um, I think machine learning is the heart and soul of autonomous vehicles. That's how I think of it. Because uh, one of the main tasks which autonomous vehicles need to do is perception, like when, and that too in a completely automated manner. So, you know, we need both accurate machine learning models and efficient hardware, which can crunch all that video, um, all that, you know, a lot of sensor data and image data. Uh, quickly and accurately. So, um, so hardware startups can play a huge role right there by building custom systems um, for autonomous cars. Um, that's there's lots of research going on in that space. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, mean, I can add just a little bit. I mean, in the research domain. So, you know, David and I, with another collaborator, have been working on computer vision you know, algorithms and machine learning mm -hmm. and so on and so forth, mainly for small scale, so not for full-on autonomous self-driving car type things, more for robotics on a small scale, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there's a couple companies that a lot of people in the audience probably know better than I do coming out of Michigan that have at least a somewhat relevance to this, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, Jason Corso in our department is a computer vision specialist and he has a startup company and I don't know the exact nature of what he's doing there. Uh, and then May Mobility out of CSE is, is mm -hmm. a, a autonomous vehicle yeah. company out of uh, at Olson's group, uh, so there's, there's there's several companies there that are definitely touching on this. Um, you know, my personal opinion is that truly self-driving cars are, you know, many 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 years away, uh, nowhere near, uh, you know, you know. So I think the rumors of their arrival are greatly exaggerated. Um, so I think that it's great for research. Um, and I have a friend in uh, Berkeley who just had his startup acquired by Tesla in this space. Um, and so you know, certainly it can be a lucrative uh, field to go into. But uh, if you you know, so I think that right now we're, we're focusing on the smaller scale than, than the big vehicles. That said, M City does have a driverless shuttle. Right <laughs> <around our campus. laughs> Just don't get in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> it will be bad. <laughs> we have a few more minutes. We'll take another question. All right. Oh, question. Yeah. Why are you calling it post CMOS? Why are we calling it post CMOS? Is the question. Um, I don't think I titled the, uh, the panel. But, uh, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think that's a good question because a lot of what we're going to be doing is is not really post CMOS, right? So Wei had a, a nice discussion of the different approaches to post CMOS. He talked about 3D stacking, he talked about computed memory, but those are still based on a CMOS platform. Mm -hmm. So unless you're fundamentally changing the switch mm -hmm. from a MOSFET uh, to something else, um, then you know you could argue that that's not really truly post CMOS. Now Way's companies and Way's technology is largely on a resistive RAM and using that for compute. And so when you embed that into a CMOS chip or, or very closely with, I would argue that, that you could say that's post CMOS because you're doing compute with novel new memory devices. 
um, but you're still fundamentally using CMOS. And I think that's a really important point is that, let's say three nanometers or two, if you're lucky, ends up being the final CMOS node. That node is going to be used for many, many, many years. Okay, it's you know, and, and then David's points come to light, which is that mm -hmm. the designers then and the architects have to basically figure out how to use the same te technology, the same transistors, mm -hmm. you know, as they did 10 years ago, but use them in more intelligent ways. So I think the burden you know, can shift a little bit. Meanwhile, in the background, all the all the device engineers and researchers are going to be working as hard as they possibly can to figure out what that next switch is going to be. But it's clearly clearly a very challenging problem, and no one knows the answer to that. Yeah, I think I think it is historically uh, part of the reason is because we thought there was going to be a non CMOS switch, uh, and that really hasn't materialized. Uh, now Wei Lu in his work has shown a post CMOS memory element, and that's partly why now compute is also moving into memory. Uh, but the switch hasn't really switched from CMOS. But there were many candidates, um, and none of those have worked out, and so there was this expectation that. Right, that would be that, and, but we still still call it those CMOS. Maybe I'll yeah. Add, maybe uh, <laughs> maybe it's yeah. It's not technically post CMOS, but uh, people are looking beyond conventional materials. Uh, conventional, uh, for example, in the past it's just silicon and silicon oxide, but now people are looking at every element on the uh, periodic table. So in this <laughs> sense, you can say it's not conventional CMOS. It's a still yes. It's st it post silicon yes. So it's still the same uh, device structure, but you are looking much broader material side. You are looking heterogeneous integration, these type of things. So it's not just simply scaling of CMOS, but uh, uh, different man side. Yeah, and I would just add that although the materials is not post CMOS, that trend is pushing us to think beyond it mm -hmm. in all across the stack. So you know, it's still not happened, as they all said, but the fear of that happening is making us drive towards all this innovation. Great, well we are at the end of our time. So thank you for all the questions. I want to thank the panelists again as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs>